All right, Craig Lane, Health Alchemy YouTube channel, Community Dinner, December 4th? December 4th today? Yeah, December 4th. And we're going to do some of the same themes today, except we're going to add in um, Return of the Bird Tribe. It's a little story start. And we're going to talk about the assemblage points and perceptions and fall eating. And we had a request for our request again was for. Oh, yeah, healing, how herbs facilitate healing and anabolic processes. Um, so we're going to jump into this book called The Bird Tribes. And I'm going to point this actually towards the fire. Story time by the fire, right? Story time by the fire. There we go. Um, so the important thing about taking this in is um, it's channeled, but it's channeled um, in a very compassionate way. Um, and I don't know how much it was edited. So I'm just going to start without further ado. And the chapter is called The Bird Tribes. I remember the day when I walked across the open prairie with my head held high and my feathers blowing in the wind. The soldiers saw only my silhouette against the sky. I walked slowly towards them, arms extended from my sides, palms facing them in a gesture of peace. I watched the waves of love emanate forth from my hands, as powerful as the love I expressed before and after Golgotha. I don't know what that is. G-O-L-G-O-T-H-A. Before and after Golgotha. The hill that Jesus was uh, hung. Oh, Thank you. The soldiers shot me dead. I knew they would. But their children have been brought up on my teachings, have loved my spirit, and have understood enough of my creative principle to sail to the moon. Could I have taught them in any other way when their bullets flew and my feathers blew in the breeze that day? Could I have spoken more plainly than to the example of my deeds? I have died a million deaths and lived as many lives to teach the warrior tribes what they would not learn in any other way. I am the victor because the warrior tribes are changing fundamentally while I am rising again and again, leading them and their love and their kind ever onward towards their destiny amongst the midnight stars. I love, I live everywhere all over the earth. I have memories to draw upon where there were gentle people through whose lives I knew the land. If I try, I can remember their place names, their faces, the streets of their villages, their dances around autumn fires where the forest floor smelled of dry leaves and moonlight, filtered shadows through the naked trees. But other things I do not have to try to remember because those things I can never forget. I am those things. I am often the mountain lakes because there were the last place my people lived before they flew, before they left their human forms and took to the airs of spirit or realms of nature to wait for cycles and changing seasons to bring their time to the world again. I could show you where 500 people lived on the shores of one such lake. You might glimpse a human only occasionally. As you might see an otter, beaver or raccoon, so blended were their waves and so in harmony with the earth and sun they're living. By the time of which I speak was long before recent European migrations, long before civilizational influence touched Olmec or Mayan heart. Our cultures were pacific then in this undiscovered world between troubled Asians and warring European tribes. Your records speak little of the Americas because until recently our cultures did not create history. Our ways were simple. Our troubles until about 2,500 years ago were few. Only a few of our consciousness have dressed in human form these 2,500 years now past. Yet when we did, you could not distinguish us from the others. We did not fight. When I put on my headdress and rode my horse across the prairies, I was teaching. I was not fighting. I taught with feather shafted arrows and landscapes that cradled the sunlight in a thousand sacred meanings. I drew the cavalry to where the prettiest valleys to drink from the streams most likely to give them the truth so that their children would grow up in the hills near those streams and eat the corn and summer squash that would teach them the wisdom their tribe had forgotten.
So I did not mind the time my hands were spread to the side, the soldiers fired and a body died. Lying there beneath the open sky, with the high prairie grass waving around me as they rode off in dust and disarray. I drew those bullets into something deeper than a body of soil and stream. I drew them into my soul. And my spirit, my spirit flew to their source. I understood then what kind of factories made those bullets. I understood then what kind of factories made those bullets. What kind of women and children worked in those factories? I understood how they felt about their families as they were pouring the lead of these bullets. How they regarded their land, what they taught, what they thought of their fathers and their mothers and their grandmothers and their tumbling, billowing, rolling with them in their jumbled tribal consciousness like towering thunderheads that massed over the prairie. I too dreamed their dreams and found in them what was true and made it my own. By digesting their metal, I learned further of the teachings that would speak to the warrior heart. I taught them of electronics, of radio waves whispering wonders on the wind, of metal wings and material things that would lead them down the slow but certain path to wisdom. Again, as time after time before, I strengthened the educational influence I have been weaving in, around, and among their societies while I drew them ever onward to their destiny. This is the last paragraph. You thought you could, you could shoot the dwellers at the prairies and forests and they would somehow disappear like a troublesome dream. You did not realize that they are my own just as you are, that they would reappear in your children and in your children's children, and as your own people live again. For like you, the Native Americans of recent centuries have also been of warrior descent with lessons to learn not unlike your own, but this was not always so. Once we were, we expressed to the American people whose societies saw our creations flower and flow like living brushstrokes across the river valleys, lakes and forested mountains of two continents. Listen and I will tell you of my kind, of the few who have remained to teach and guide you through your twilight age. I will tell you of our patient work. As century by century, we brought the fearful ones closer and closer to the time of their deliverance and the time of Earth's salvation. This is Ken Carey, Return of the Bird Treads. So that's channeled, and he, um, you were talking about perception, and so it's easy for me to go to this meta view. This is a meta view, and for some of us, it's a little more difficult than others. In the Native American medicine wheel, this is the direction of the king or the queen, the sovereign, depending on which sex you are. Your sovereign is what sees your big picture and how you manage your own kingdom or queendom. And I'm, a, I'm just stuck in the meta view. That's where I live. I'm only about half to two thirds here at any given moment. Most of the time I'm partially off in the meta view, like the plants. You know, the plants are as much me as me. And I had such a deep resonance with this because um, I have Native American spirits that speak to me. When I lived in LA when I was 24 years old, I was driving over, a, over a Highway 405 down into the, the um, was that? Yeah, in the San Fernando Valley there. And I, this pops in my head, it says Wonderland. It's like this Native spirit was looking out through my eyes and he goes, wow, Wonderland. And you're in a metal box with four wheels and and um, and just driving over this thing, and this Native American spirit said, "This is like flying, coming over the mountain and then down." And um, my old friend Paul Damon um, had a saying that I'm a red man in a white man's body. And I think a lot of us, um, the seven generations later, after all the slaughter of the natives 200 or so years ago, they said the seventh generation from them would wake up the whites and the children of the natives. So we're seeing it all around us. The time of our deliverance is at hand. Um, if, you, if you can't see it now, you're never gonna see it. <laughs> you know, look around you. So how do we maintain clarity? And in the group I'm leading, we spent quite a bit of time talking about discernment versus judgment. 
If you're in judgment, you're in delusion. If you're in discernment, you're seeing what's so. How do you tell the difference between discernment and judgment? Somebody who hasn't heard me, heard the answer so far. Because Monica, you can't answer. You've heard enough. How do you know the difference between discernment and judgment in your own experience? Subjectivity versus objectivity. I haven't heard that one. Recept re Subjectivity versus objectivity. Yes, precisely. But someone else might not be able to translate that to their own experience. Like you know what that feels like, I think. But what's another way of saying that? Yeah, getting close. Being a witness. Witness. Everybody's correct. There's just sort of one good word that anybody will get. Observer. Sure. But the observer, there's a little sort of an implied detachment. And this isn't detached at all. This is fully engaged. Fully engaged objectively. So what's the difference between your personal experience of objectivity versus subjectivity? What's the difference in that internally? That's well put because it gets to another angle. How about reflection? Reflection? But how's, what kind of reflection? How does it feel? I don't want to say soul connection. But I don't <clears throat> so I'm going to digress and give you another hint because I think it's better if you get your own answer. And that's um, discernment is part of the fire element, which is connected to the heart and the intestines in Chinese medicine. It's fire element. The small intestine separates the pure from the impure. There's discernment right there. Okay, so, so one comes from the heart, the other comes from the head. Right. But the way you can really nail it, I got this from Shakti Gawain, Creative Visualization. I read that like 30 years ago. I was dying to know what's a real insight versus a delusional insight, you know? And, and she nailed it, and then I was able to tie it into my Chinese medical study years later, and that's discernment has no emotion associated with it. It's complete neutrality. It's fact. It's objective. The wall is white bricks. I don't have a charge about that. If I was in a tortured uh, Mexican prison with white brick walls, I might have a judgment about it, right? The fucking wall well, I spent 10 years with those white brick walls. See the difference? One is seeing what is so. It's neutral. There's no polarity internally with it. We all know what that feels like. You just know. I'll pick on the men for a minute. The ladies almost always know when a man cheats on them. They just know. And there's that moment when it first comes in where there's no emotionality. It's like, oh, fuck. Something's invaded my boundary. And many, they're going to get away with it. And they never do. Right? Usually they never get away with it. So judgment then is when you see something that's so and there's a judgment, there might be discernment and judgment together too. They could arise together. You know, I could, I could say there's white bricks there, but I could also have a big charge about it, right? So one is the energy draining and one is not. And so when this guy in this book here, you know, whether it happened or not, is talking about, he's talking about a deep discernment, right? He took that bullet into his own fucking soul and felt the compassion and the empathy of people who made those bullets. That's like the highest level soul I can think of outside of the guy I heard a Tibetan Lama that was kidnapped by the Chinese and tortured for 30 years. And they asked him, what were you doing for 30 years? What do you think he said? Having compassion for my torturers. Wow. That's serious, serious high level soul. I wouldn't have no compassion for my, I'd be thinking of how the ways I'm going to strangle them and barbecue them and kill them, you know? be no compassion in my world, to be honest, you know? So that's high level work, right? High level soul. Which sort of ties in with um, things that are building to life are generally things that come out of nature. Things that are building to life generally don't require a lot of emotionality. You know, you go get a fresh plant matter and once it's 24 hours old, you can see for yourself. You're never gonna have as much vitality on a plant that's 24 hours old versus a plant that's freshly picked out of the ground, never. And that's where we've gone astray because um, as I've talked about, vitamins are processes. 
and we don't throw out the chemistry, the chemistry is part of the process. You're going to hear this from me almost every time you see me because it's the most important thing to get moving forward is that a snapshot of you running a race is not you running the race. When you take a chemistry parameter, it's a snapshot of a certain parameter at a moment in time of a process. I don't care what you call it. We've been looking down the wrong avenue. What's the process that caused the chemistry? We do lab work in my world. We don't do just one lab work. We do one lab work and then another one three months later. So we see the trajectory of the process. Your blood sugar is getting hot. It's going down. Your alkaline phosphatase liver enzyme is getting more congested, less. So we have this liniment that's going around. I have this cut on my finger now, which I actually have a picture of it, but it was really ugly. There, You can see it on the camera there. Very, very ugly, ugly cut. It was a flap right here and everything. And... Um, I took fresh plant matter, um, specifically from the, the, the gardening class. They're called wound warts, W-O-N-D, W-O-R-T, wound warts, plantain and yarrow specifically. Chewed them up, put them right on the wound that was bleeding and spurting blood. It was literally <laughs> spurting blood. And within 24 hours, the bleeding had stopped. In normal world, most people would have gotten stitches, you know, two or three sutures on that. But... I knew that going to emergency care meant $5,000 out of my pocket. And this meant $0. So I'll take the $0 and not going to the, the COVID. God, don't get me started on that. Yeah. Shit. So can you tell us what you put on it? Uh, plantain, Plantago psyllium. Okay. Oh, no, it's Plantago major. Excuse me. Plantago major, plantain, and um, yarrow. Which I forgot the Latin name of yarrow. So, how much? Enough. And how much did you chew? So they were a green mush. I think there's something about the saliva getting on there too. Um, you know, a complete, like if I did that in the hospital, they would have cringed, right? Yeah. They would have just cringed. Oh, he's got saliva on the wound. Ah! <laughs> but I'm reading a book right now by one of Ajanus' students, the primal diet guy. And Ajanus' whole thing was about, and this guy cured 90% of cancer patients given to him that were set to die in three months. This is not a guy you mess with. That's why he's dead now, because he, had, he was curing a lot of cancer people on his raw meat, raw veggie diet. And so he says that, I was just reading about viruses and his take on viruses, and I just love what this guy, it's an empowering view of bacteria, viruses, all the bugs that are in our body, when we get a tumor or whatnot, it's not bad. Those bugs are there because they're breaking down our waste for us. Very empowering view of microbes. So when you get COVID, it's exactly as I said right from the start, your cells have toxic sweat, the toxic sweat becomes these protid-like molecules, and they form themselves into viruses internally. This is not an external germ thing. Remember the talk I gave on HIV, briefly went over it? There was a 10,000 people studied HIV study from 1990 to 1999. No, 1980 to 1989. And I read the book about it. And these guys that were researching thousands of AIDS patients came to the same conclusion that I always have. It's an internal mutation. So when we say you get COVID or you get something from the external, it's because you're getting the other person's breathing out the toxic waste of the microbes that are trying to break down their own toxic waste. So it's a way more empowering view of health that you're responsible for your health. You ain't no fucking victim. And I'm going to say the effort because it pisses me off. You know, you're a victim to some viruses do not have volition. They don't fly through the air trying to get you. They don't even exist in the way we think they do. Any, I challenge any of you, show me an actual electron micrograph of a virus. They don't exist. I don't know why we think they do. I've never seen one. I thought about today. I've never seen anything to do with a virus ever. I've never seen an electron, just an animated whatever, a drawing of it. They don't exist in the way we think they do. They don't have volition. They don't have DNA. They can't reproduce. Ogenius calls them ghosts in the body. Now, I don't go as far as they don't exist, personally. Um, there's something going on, but we've been lied to about it. So internal mutation, self-responsibility. Um, we'll take questions a little bit. Keep that one on, because i got to get this uh, thing going. So we're looking at, are we repairing? Like in the finger, some herbs repair. And in medicine, we call that anabolism. It's the process of building tissue. And then things that tear down tissue, like cortisol, are catabolic. 
or when you lift weights, it's catabolic. You're tearing down tissue and it'll rebuild itself later. And that's a classic yin yang, like it's a duality, right? One's building up, one's tearing down. That's why I like Chinese medicine. As a matter of fact, John T, you'll love this. Uh, 20 years ago in a Chinese medical clinical workshop, this guy's like, he's like, you know, you ever stuck on a tough case because a bunch of us had a bunch of tough cases? He goes, just break it down into yin and yang. And I've done that for 20 years since. That's how I always figure out the tough cases. You just break it down into the simple dualities occurring in the person. The process is occurring. Yes, chemistry is part of figuring out the process is occurring, right? Mm -hmm. Too wet, too dry, too hot, too cold, too excessive, too deficient. It works so well, right? It just works fabulously because anybody can figure that out. Oh, I feel, yeah, when I have a hot, wet towel on my head, that's damp heat and it feels a certain way. I got a cold, damp towel on my head. Damp, cold. I mean, most of us who have studied this, it's just, it's so apparent, like, this is what's missing. This is what's missing because it's subjective health. So the herbs that I put together for, um, I'll just say someone's finger, I won't, I won't name you today, um, were, Particularly helpful with um, trauma and wound healing, and uh, it's myrrh, cayenne, and golden seal is what's in the liniment. And that's uh, credited to Jethro Kloss and his old herb book, Back to Eden. That was my first herb book 30 years ago. Jethro Kloss, Back to Eden. Highly recommend it. It's about that fat. <laughs> it's literally that fat. It's, uh, and there's an all-purpose liniment in there. And then I took it a step further, and I added uh, plantain and yarrow and self-heal, the three classic wound warts to that blend. Let's see you brewing over there on something. So when we're building up, it feels a certain way. And when we're in alignment and harmony, it feels a certain way. And that's here, here what I'm to point out is, you know, an hour after you eat tonight, everybody check in. If you don't have more energy, the meal didn't work. If you're, that's my report for 25 years of being a nutritionist. If you don't have more energy after you eat, the meal didn't work, throw out your freaking dogma. I was a vegan 20 years ago, always tired after I ate. Always eating, always eating, always eating. It was screwy. And I would drop down to 155 pounds. My libido went away and my athleticism went away. So for me, you know, we all have our own diet. My diet's meat and dairy and veggies. That's it. Nothing else works. So what I just had was raw tuna with a salad that's my dinner i don't eat any of that stuff right now i don't have a green light for it you know self muscle test like no so a lot of us we sell ourselves out for peer pressure because we want that extra goodie because our brain thinks it's going to taste good and then we're tired and we wonder why and um there's no normal amount of gas after a meal if you had any symptom after you're eating the meal didn't work and if you're craving more food after you're done eating the meal also didn't work and there's no compromise in that because each of us knows. Just like we know certain things and then we go try to get validated. After 25 years, that's my report. You gotta find your diet. And I'm a good, I'm a good helper because I know how to find the stuff and track it. So the finger part is just part of like, you know, we, we don't heal as fast as we might like because we're not getting enough vitamin C. And even if you're taking vitamin C, you might not be getting enough. Why do you think? you're not getting the vitamin C fresh out of the ground and the raw food right out of the ground, that is the highest form of vitamin C. Wait till our plant talk on Wednesday, Monica. I got a real juicy, I got a, I'm looking into chlorophyll and how the plants make chlorophyll and the chloroplast and how the plant takes freaking sunlight and water and minerals and then makes this magical sugar molecule and chlorophyll molecule out of that. Talk about alchemy. And that plant blood and human blood are identical. That's right, they are. Chlorophyll and hemoglobin are identical, except for one molecule. Hemoglobin has iron at the center. Chlorophyll has magnesium at the center. You want a good magnesium source? Eat more greens. That's called red blood cell magnesium. And you can check for that on lab work. Probably one of the more important lab parameters that nobody ever talks about. Your red blood cell magnesium. And to back that up, I met a vegan, uh, one of the few successful vegan stories I've ever seen. <laughs> but this was like Rosemary Gladstar, big time herbalist back east in 1996. And um, it wasn't Rosemary, it was one of the herbalists, it was an elder. And um, 
she would do raw greens every day, wheatgrass, and she boiled up horsetail, oat straw, and stinging nettles every day and drank that broth. And she looked fantastic. She was like 69, 70. And I was a young man, full of judgments. And I was, I mean, I was checking her out, like, mm, hypocrisy over there. A lot of hypocrisy in my teachers. A lot of hypocrisy. So I was probing her and like, no, she's the real deal. 100% vegan. And her blood work looked great too. Why? She was getting live greens in with the chlorophyll, which is identical to hemoglobin. Got to be raw though. Once you cook that chlorophyll, no longer helpful. Now, for a protein type metabolically, blood type O protein type northern climate person, that might not work. They, they sometimes need that heme iron that's only an animal protein. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I'm one of them. I can live pretty long on chlorophyll, wheatgrass, and you know, vegan juices in the summer and hot weather like Costa Rica, but around here, nope. Um, and, but I'm extreme metabolically. I'm very extreme over here on the protein type need fat for energy kind of type. Been researching this a little more recently the last few days and it turns out that we're supposed to, like you, those of you who are mixed types have a lot of B answers on your test. You're the people that you can go to digesting carbohydrates for energy and fat for energy easily. You should be able to do any of it. But my natural metabolism leans towards fat for energy. If I do carbs, they oxidize and turn into free radicals. So I get really hot when I overeat carbohydrates and then I get really cold afterwards. But the, I'm, like I said, I'm a rare type. And generally, the further north your ancestors lived, the more you need protein and fat. And the more towards the equator your ancestors lived, the more you need carbohydrates. You know, this is without the dogma, right? If you're a blood type O, generally you're going to need animal protein. If you're a blood type A, you're going to have trouble with animal protein. These are generalities, you know, but I'm just giving you guys a little bit of it. So when the, when the finger won't heal or whatnot, then usually it's a protein vitamin C deficiency issue. And what the liniment does is it gives you that because we've captured some of those elements in the tincture. Um, and I mean, golden seal is well known as a healing herb, you know, on the right, especially topically. And but who would have thought of myrrh, right? It's four parts myrrh, two parts golden seal, one part cayenne in their master formula. So it's like head scratch, you go, myrrh of all things. But what is myrrh? Is myrrh a disinfectant? Oh yeah, it is. Very good disinfectant. Not that I'm into germ theory per se, but um, we'll have to give them a little credit. Give those germies a little credit. <laughs> so then that ties in with, um, you know, like, uh, let's just pick on, let's see, lower end problem. Like um, you ladies, have all of you ladies had a urinary tract infection before? You all know how miserable that is? Have any of you ladies had a yeast infection downstairs? You know how miserable that is? Yeah, it's going to affect your consciousness, isn't it? Yeah. So that's where, you know, usually when we're in pain, and remember back to, where's that ease disease thing? I had this really good. So when we're at ease in our own body, then we're going to be able to think more clearly and be more effective in the world. So as soon as we're, we lose our ease, that's when illness starts dis-ease, not at ease in your own skin. That's vata derangement, the Ayurvedic say The first thing that happens when you get, start getting sick is your vata gets deranged. Same freaking thing. In Chinese, the internal wind gets stirred up, lack of ease. We're just pointing at natural law phenomena here. You call it whatever you want. So uh, I loosely take the wind thing. I mean, it's not you know, my teacher would be screaming at me right now. But I made my, one of my teachers said, make it your own. And that's what I'm doing. I think we do have internal wind and it's related to the air element. It's related to Vata and Ayurveda. And it relates to a lack of ease. So to get back to that place, um, I'm going to say one, one of the most important amino acids that you probably hadn't thought about a lot is tryptophan. Why? Because it gets made into DMT. Dimethyltryptamine is made from tryptophan. And so your consciousness will probably suffer on protein deficiency, and that's generally what I've seen. Uh, there's no such thing as a carbohydrate that's essential. You have essential fatty acids and you have essential amino acids. 
There's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. So that's where, that's where I start with my diet. I eat my essentials first, and then I know that I need to check in an hour after I eat. And if I tired an hour after I eat, crap, too much rice. It's always too much carb. Sometimes actually too much vegetable. That's another duality you should look at. How much fiber do I need versus non-fibrous foods? Some people do quite well on just meat and dairy with almost no fiber. I've been studying the heck out of this with Ajahnu's raw, raw meat diet. And then there are people that they don't even eat any veggies. They're just eating raw meat and raw dairy, raw butter, and maybe a few bits of fruit and a few veggies here and there. It kind of throws in the toilet my 50 to 70% food volume being vegetables for most people. So what you have to do is find the right amount that works for you and throw out the dogma. So what kind of fiber foods do I do well with, right? How much raw versus cooked is another duality we all play with, right? So do you want more raw this time of year or more cooked? You're going to survive on raw kale all winter in Santa Cruz? Probably not. Probably not. But you could survive quite well. Like, and um, I love picking on the Eskimos, you know, like they probably had seals and fish just thrown into the snow, you know, and carve off a chunk. And in the wintertime, you got your raw seal meat, right? You don't even need a refrigerator, just throw it in the snow. <laughs> hey, you gotta get that seal out of the fridge, please. <laughs> Go outside, chop, chop, chop. I got, I got, went out to the fridge, honey. <laughs> I got a big fridge. I got a real big fridge. <laughs> so when you're in the tropics have you all been in a really hot humid climate before you don't want to eat a big heavy steak no. no like maybe fish you know fruit and veggies you know i don't even want rice when it's that hot i go to costa rica it's like i can't even think let alone walk around it's like and the ocean is like 85 degrees which is not even refreshing in costa rica either I remember the first time I went down there, I was getting ready to jump in. It was boiling hot outside, and I jump in the ocean. God, I was disappointed. <laughs> no refreshment. <laughs> it's just like, what? <laughs> what? This is a ripoff. I want my money back. I'm not refreshed. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see. Well, he was up in... Um, Juan Acosta, Tronconis, that's where I went first. And yeah, I think Atlantic side was warmer. Yeah. Yeah, it was warmer. Um, God, do I want to go there too much? I don't want to think. Oh, the pernicious influences. Okay. So your pernicious influences tie in there. So if you don't get enough good quality food in, then what other pernicious influences out of the six you think you'd be more susceptible this time of year? We have wind, damp, dry, hot, cold, and summer heat. So damp and cold and wind. There you go. Wind, cold, damp. I have not one, but two hernias from wind, cold, damp invasion. I have an England hernia on the left side, and I have a hiatal hernia, and I have a brand new England hernia on the right side. From 40 years of surfing in the wind, cold, damp. 40 years. And, and, you know, Jaunty understands, you know, cold invasion for me now is painful. My whole right, if I let my right leg get cold, it's like walking on a fire stick. Really painful. So I can't let my legs get cold. I actually have these really nerdy red, red tights on. I wear all winter long now. Long underwear, red tights, all out myself. Um, I have an old picture that I got him when I was with Noel, and I'm doing this disco move, and um, it's a legendary photo, but I rarely show it. You really get Craig Lane in a disco move. <laughs> uh, um, so with that being said, then how do you, I mean, you know, I like to surf and still go out. So what do you do for wind, damp, cold? Like what are your remedies? You start there. Hot soup. Hot soup, very good, okay, hot soup. What kind of spices would you use? Ginger. Ginger, good. What else? Cayenne. Well, not so much. One of my teachers says cayenne is a very shallow surface level heat. And so it doesn't, it just kind of opens up the pores very quickly and then closes them back down. And if you're doing ginger, it's dry ginger in the winter versus fresh ginger. Fresh ginger opens up the pores, kind of like cayenne. You want the dry ginger in the winter. It's more of a deep core heat. 
Um, so fresh ginger and dry ginger are two different herbs to me, They're completely different actions. Cinnamon, Cinnamon excellent, yes. Turmeric, excellent, yes. What is it? What else? Turmeric with warm yeah, mm -hmm. right, golden milk. What's that Chinese herb they use for uh, extreme cold, Jaunty? Extreme cold. The um, <coughs> Yeah, you know which one I'm thinking of? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Quiz time. Yeah. Begins with an A. <laughs> Yeah. Is it the Chinese name or the Latin name? This is the Latin name. Yeah. Oh. Common slash. Right. Aconite. Aconite. Right. Yeah. yeah, aconite. Well, it's sort of toxic, right? It's sort of a low dose toxic herb yeah. and has to be taken very carefully. But to use it for as a yang tonic to, to, get, to get cold out of the body. I haven't used it a whole lot, but I think if I got into a bad enough shape, I'd have it around the house. You know, and it was in, it was a, um, Patents, one of those little patent pills. Great. Um, is, is nutmeg? Sure, nutmeg. Hmm. Most of your Italian herbs mm -hmm. are warming. Oregano, so rosemary, too? I'm trying to think clove, yeah. yeah. Oregano, rosemary. Not basil. Basil's not growing this time of year. Basil's more, um, it, it's warming to the adrenals in the summer, but it's not a herb that grows this time of year. Parsley, mm -hmm. garlic. Yeah, dry ginger. Used up all of our options here. Shallots. Thyme. Oh, pepper? Are you saying shallots, shallots? Well, black pepper and the, the peppers, um, they don't make my list because they're nightshades. And for some people, they're going to be completely off limits. Black pepper's a nightshade? Oh, yeah. Mm. I have no idea. All peppers are nightshades. But you'd oh, think that the, the spice pepper would be different from the. Uh, no. Black pepper's a nightshade. Wow. Yeah. That's one of those things to avoid for arthritis. Yes. And you have this bio piperine black pepper extract being the best way to get turmeric in your body. Horse shit. Right. That's a bunch of horse shit. You can have any pungent, as you know, in Chinese medicine, you have a formula and you have a carrier. And generally the carriers are pungent herbs. You could, I prefer ginger to black pepper personally. Mm -hmm. And that stupid drink that what was that one drink where it's maple syrup and the cayenne and lemon juice? Oh, really? The Master Cleanse? The master cleanse? Yeah, they that's... give it all out of context. The Master Cleanse is a book that's that thick. Yeah, I read So that, that drink is part of the process. You don't just take the drink. Oh, yeah. That's what almost killed Kelly's husband. You know, the, the ITP he had, all of the miracle? Huh. He was doing the freaking Master Cleanse drink and killing himself with it. Do the rest of it you're saying don't just do the maple syrup is a cooked sugar what the fuck use raw honey cayenne is a nightshade what the fuck use fresh ginger lemon juice great so yeah do the drink but do fresh ginger and lemon and and ginger and honey for god's sakes not cooked maple syrup and a freaking nightshade are you freaking kidding me This is what I do for a living, is clean up other people's dumb messes. Like, oh my God. I thought they use maple syrup because it's got some anti-cancer. So does honey. And, and, and honey is raw. I thought it was because it was B vitamins. Yeah, they said it's the B vitamins and it's the only food made from sap. And that the sap has an enormous amount of different minerals that make a difference for... I'm not against maple syrup, but it's a cooked sugar. It is definitely good. That means pancreatic stress. And those enzymes, I've been telling you about enzymes. You have to use enzymes when you think. Use enzymes for everything. You wouldn't be alive without enzymes. So am I going to put my enzymes into a fucking cooked sugar or a raw sugar? I'm putting mine into a raw sugar, thank you very much, that has the enzymes to digest itself. And then my enzymes can process. That's how we get cancer, by the way. We don't process our own waste because we process our own waste with enzymes. So the more cooked food you eat, the more in the enzyme bank you're in the toilet. And the more cooked food you eat, the more you have a white blood cell count higher than after you eat. Remember, I told you guys this many times. Mm -hmm. Edward Howell, studying this in the 50s, digestive leukocytosis. If you don't eat at least 51% raw at a meal, you have an elevated white blood cell count. That's the origins of all autoimmune problems right there. Excessive cooked and refined foods. This was all studied 70, 80 years ago, and it was buried. Why? Cha-ching is why. Yeah. 
You suckers. They ain't getting away with it much longer. Not on my watch. And their COVID horseshit. God, let me started on that. Um, and I'm on film too. Hey, FCC, fuck off. <laughs> you know, so it's really important to track how you feel after you eat again, right? So I'm all for the, the master cleansing. It's a great program, but you know, modify it, please, and read the whole book and follow the whole program, not the frickin' drink, as Charlie got an earful, you know, for the first three weeks I saw him. But that's why he healed so fast, because we heal faster when we remove the obstacles of our own stupidity first. <laughs> I mean, I got a thousand of my own. Anybody who knows me knows. You've seen the stupidity, Well, No one else is like 16 years old. You think he's seen a mountain of stupidity? Exactly. <laughs> I'm not claiming any degree of enlightenment over here. <laughs> I learned what I learned because I survived my mistakes. Very lucky. Okay. What time are we at? I'm going to wind this up in a minute. Um, so there's this assemblage point thing, and that's a place from which we perceive. So the reason why I eat and live the way I do is so I can perceive cleanly. And see, Castaneda, his teacher Don Juan Mattis called it the assemblage point. It's too heady for me. I like the perception point, the place from which we perceive reality. And there's gates around our brain that they've figured out that gate our reality. They're called sensory gates. Um, I don't have the book out here today, but that's uh, Stephen Herod Buner's work of, um, the Secret, no, The Lost Language of Plants, his first book in the 90s, and his newer one called Plant Intelligence exactly. and the Imaginal Realm. If you want to add in that other one that I've been talking about, that um, the, the, essential, the Chemistry of Essential Oils, Peter Stewart book, David Stewart book, that's another one that's a bridge gapper. The Chemistry of Essential Oils, Peter Stewart, subtitle, God's Love Manifest in Molecules. What? Now, there's a bridge woo-woo guy right there. He's got the science. He's got the woo-woo. My kind of guy. Barbara Brennan, hands of light, energy healer. She was a NASA scientist. Didn't even believe in anything woo-woo. Started seeing auras just like I did. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. What's happening? I'm seeing something I can't explain. You guys better investigate that. So we open up our assemblage point by, um, by, by eating more healthily, and then we can also open it up when we take entheogens. Let's name a few entheogens here. You guys count on your way out. Entheogens on the way out. Those are plants that uh, get you in line with your DMT and your alignment. Bye, guys. You seen you guys. As the entheogens leave. So low level is cannabis. Uh, Buner has all these plants in the book, um, Plant Intelligence, all these plants that do this, he talks about at length in the book. What, what else? Psilocybin. Psilocybin. Um, Cannabis. The ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. Um, what's boga. Boga. Peyote. To a certain degree, yeah. To a certain degree, yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually, I smoked a plant called Mimosa Pudica, I think it was, um, with uh, Dr. Juan, who, and he was still alive. And I told the story, so I won't go into it again. Um, um, I've done uh, Salvian Divinorum, although that, the ally of Divinorum is a trickster. And I wouldn't fuck with Divinorum unless you got invited. I, I had literally had three Divinorum plants delivered to my door by a guy that thought I should have them. Now, that's not freaky. I don't know what is freaky. I've been reading about it and you know, heard about it. And then within a few months, this guy just appears at my door. Oh, I met you at the farmer's market. Remember a few months ago and I asked you about Devin Orm? I'm like, yeah, I forgot about you. He's like, well, here they are. I'm like, maybe I better try this plant, you know? And first time I did it, did a, I was living over on Corcoran. It's a beautiful bedroom. It had a little pot on a, on a water pipe bomb. Put the Devin Orm on top, smoked it, exhaled. There was no crate. But then a leprechaun appeared from me to James. Mm. A leprechaun guy about this tall. And he goes, Whew! and this portal opens up. And there was no Craig, but I knew not to jump in that freaking portal. He's all, 
And I'm like, I'm like uh, I don't know what I am, but I ain't going in that portal, bro. There's this leprechaun guy. He looked like a kind of an evil leprechaun, you know? And I'm like, wow. Um, and then that all disappeared. And then I was just sitting in this, like, in the, and the, the same thing as what happened when I took DMT before. The first thing I felt was my left big toe. That was me. And then the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that are Craig Lane started coming back together. But if you're not prepared for that moment when your consciousness is obliterated, you're, you're going to have problems. Oh, LSD. We forgot about LSD. That's another one. Is that really? That's considered oh, yeah. It'll, it'll blow you open for sure. Ask Leary and all those cats. Oh, no, I thought it's not natural. Yeah, not necessarily. Right. But I've also used 5-MeO-DMT, and it's not necessarily natural either. I had a good experience with that, too. I think these are side effects, right? You do LS, you know, was it lysergic acid? Is that what it is? You know, lysergic acid and 5-MeO-DMT. You're, you're dealing with chemicals, and then you're dealing also with the consciousness that made those chemicals. So if the guy making the acid was pissed off, probably not that good. Right? The guy making the 5-MeO-DMT, if he's pissed off. Can I tell you the story about one of my teachers? I had a teacher's teacher. Um, he said, my teacher never left the mountains of China much. One of those old school guys. And he said, he would never let anyone eat cook for him who wasn't a high level adept because of the energy they're putting into the food as they're making it. That's a high level human being, right? So he wouldn't, he wouldn't let any of us touch his food. Ah, get away from my food, you can't touch it. Your bad consciousness will get in there. That sounds awfully negative for insights too, just to say that. But I'm saying it. I don't know what he said. <laughs> this is all my projections. You know how it is. Oh, okay. These are Craig's projections. You know. So my insights are going, oh, no, 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 right now. Okay, let's move on. So the sensory gates, I think one of the most important points that it's going to keep coming back to is um, what is a bad sign that your sensory gates are uh, not open? The word begins with an M. I've been talking about it for every week for the last eight weeks. <laughs> <laughs> mucus, <laughs> mucus again. The word of the season. <laughs> the word of the season. If you have mucus coming out your mouth, you got mucus in your brain. It's it's that simple. So you know, I've had my fair share recently. Um, had my big indulgence yesterday. I had a tablespoon and a half of coffee with my Ticino. Had some mucus later. Had some mucus afterwards, and it was from the coffee. It wasn't from the dairy. Do you have a, a radish chaser? Yeah. <laughs> no, I should have, actually. <laughs> no, I should have. Okay, I think I've... Uh, that's, that's all I want to go with that. The pernicious influences. So, I think I'm just talking about that for a minute. So, hot soups. So if you get the, the wind cold damp, then it's good to have grounding food. So, burdock root's a very grounding root. I find it really helps for wind-related stuff. Uh, burdock root. Another thing, um, you know, about wind in general is, um, you know, when you're in the wind, think about it. The plants that are growing in the wind, I've watched them. You ever watch plants when they grow in the wind? They always have more roots going out to the sides laterally because, you know, they, they send their roots out because the wind doesn't blow them over them. And so wouldn't it make sense to have plants that have high tensile strength? Because what my number one wind plant is internally. High tensile strength. It's a stem, hint, hint. <laughs> yeah, right. Celery. Celery. Yeah, it's high tensile strength, right? You can't really tear it apart easily. Celery. And Bernard Jensen spoke to celery as being high in nerve salts, S A L T S, so nerve minerals. So, celery has been one of my superfoods for the last 25 years, and I'm finally being validated by some other people. It also chelates out heavy metals, doesn't it? It can, yeah. Chlorophyll can too. I was doing some study on chlorophyll earlier and it, uh, well, I better not go there. But you can't go wrong with greens. If you're doing a good protein source, a decent fat source, and your, your fresh raw greens, you're, you're doing pretty well, especially if the meat and dairy is raw. But, you know, not, not a lot of us want to have a, you know, raw fish or raw stick. Finally, when you're in this place where you're in your assemblage point, your correct perception, and you're feeling at ease in your body, then you get to, um, you get to live in love. And 
living in love is not as easy as we think. Because I'm going to read, that's the segue to the prophet. And um, my mother had this book by her bedside most of my life. I was always curious, never looked at it once until I was an adult. Never even opened it. But I saw this face through my entire childhood. And she had this book by her bed. I was like, it's kind of a weird, funny looking face. I was actually intimidated. I don't, it was kind of scary. I don't want to open up that book, you know? And then as an adult, I was like, I gotta look at that thing. Wait a minute. So I'm gonna read the, uh, the one on love. There's a bunch of good, this is the prophet. So when you're living in love, then you have the fortitude, if you even from a clear place, you have the fortitude to live in love. And you know what? It's gonna be easier just to do it on here. I have it on my Google Drive. Then it could be shared with all the peoples too. So my teacher, Adyashanti, has a saying that just popped in, and um, he says, every love sheds a tear, if it's true. Every love sheds a tear. All right. So yeah, Khalil Gibran lived from 1883 to 1931. Let's honor this person. And, um, and my friend, before I read this, I want to honor Rich Sundance Owen, who I sent his button around. Thank you, Sundance. And Cedar, I hope at some point I can show you this, that we are honoring your partner. What a great man he was. Okay. Speak to us of love, they asked. And he raised his head and looked upon the people. And a stillness fell upon them. With a great voice, he says, when love beckons you, you follow. Though his ways are hard and steep. And when his wings, we could say her wings, there's a lot of his in here. You know, to be gender friendly. Just imagine there's a his or a her there. Though his, her ways are hard and steep. And when his wings enfold you, yield to him. Though the sword hidden amongst his pinions may wound you. And when he speaks to you, believe in him. Though his voice may shatter your dreams as a north wind lays waste the garden. For even as love crowns you, so how she crucify you. Even as he is for your growth, so he is for your pruning. Even as he ascends to your height and caresses your tenderest branches that quiver in the sun, so how shall he descend to your roots and shake them in their clinging to the earth. Like sheaves of corn, he gathers you unto himself. He threshes you to make you naked. He sifts you to free you from your husks. He grinds you to whiteness. He kneads you until you are pliant. And then he assigns you to his sacred fire, that you may become sacred bread in God's sacred feast. All these things shall love do unto you, that you may know the secrets of your heart, and in that knowledge become a fragment of life's heart. But if in your heart you would seek only love's peace and love's pleasure, then it is better for you that you cover your nakedness and pass out of love's threshing floor into the seasonless world where you shall laugh but not all of your laughter, and weep, but not all of your tears. Love gives not but itself, and takes not but from itself. Love possesses not, nor would it be possessed, for love is sufficient unto love. And when you love, you should not say, God is in my heart, but rather, I am in the heart of God. And think not you can direct the course of love, for love, if it finds you worthy, directs your course. Love has no other desire but to fulfill itself. But if you love and must needs have desires, let these be your desires. To melt and be like a running brook that sings its melody to the night. To know the pain of too much tenderness. To be wounded by your own understanding of love. To bleed willingly and joyfully. To wake at dawn with a winged heart and give thanks for another day of loving. To rest at noon hour and meditate love's ecstasy. To return home at eventide with gratitude. And then to sleep with a prayer for the beloved in your heart and a song of praise upon your lips. Galil Dubron on love. Pretty good, huh? Yeah. See, we're, we're sold this bait and switch baloney love, you know, in the West. Oh, you fulfill me, baby. 
You've complete me. Yuck. I mean, I think everybody in this room understands what they were pointing at there, right? I mean, love can be, you know, it can be tough. There's tough love with the sword. There's soft love. You know, there's all kinds of love. All right, 854. So we're going to wind this down. Uh, anybody have anything burning? Question, contribution that's going to be on film? Uh, anything more about the assembly point um, and perception point and ways to see and or any, anything jump to mind? Are you suggesting something we read up on in order to understand better or just take the concept and wait until it comes to us? I don't think I'm going to stop talking about it until the new year, um, but we could have just a talk where I go through what Buner is pointing at. But I think the most important thing is, you know, recognize when there's mucus, and that means you're not really coming from that centered place because it's obscured. Um, and then you continually question, really. You know, am, is, like life becomes a question. Am I actually seeing what's so? Is the inquiry. Anybody ever do meditative-based self-inquiry? It's been my main practice for 20, 25 years is meditative-based self-inquiry. Like, maybe I do Byron Katie, the work. Who would I be without that thought? Same idea. You throw out the inquiry, and you're feeling it. you throw the inquiry out. Because if the answer comes back from the mind, it's not the right answer. The answer has to come back in your being, in your heart, in your guts, in your body. So when I've asked the question, you know, who would I be without that thought, all I get is complete and utter silence. And that's, that's how I know. Oh, great. Because silence is peaceful. So who would I be without that thought? Pretty fucking peaceful. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned earlier that you know you've never, no one's seen a photograph of a virus or anything like that. that I remember right. reading a book called something like "Tired of Being Sick and Tired," right? Or something like that. And right. It was talking about pleomorphism. Exactly. Exactly. And how, um, you know, when you look at blood under a dark field microscope, you can see, it said, you can see a virus, and then you can see the virus change into bacteria, and then change into a, you know, through 16 different stages, and so it turns into a fungus or a mold. Yes. So, presumably, you know, they, they, they photograph that. Right. So, you know, you were saying, well, there's never like, no pictures of the virus. So, None that I've seen. Well, I, okay. But Bring I, it over. I, I assume look that at. the person read the, who wrote the book had seen the, the video of the, of the blood, of the dark blood of the microscope, you know? Well, I'm fascinated by that because that's where I, I do believe in viruses there, that they're part of a continuum of shape-shifting bugs. Okay. Pleomorphism means shape-shifting bugs. But they're not shifting from without, they're shifting from our own internal ecology. So if we eat shitty, we could have a normal bug, like candida, that eats waste, and then it turns parasitic when we feed it a lot of sugar. Because it's now, in a, so one of the views of cancer that I'm reading right now is the view that cancer is your body's own cells that have adapted to an anaerobic environment. Because that's what cancer is, it's a very sick, toxic body. Everybody with cancer, once you're diagnosed, you are a fucking sick, toxic person. I don't care how pure you think you are. Every single cancer person I've had is a toxic mess. Whether it's emotionally, physically, mentally, psychically, on some level, they are a toxic nightmare. And the cancer, according to a couple of theories, the cancer is nothing more, the cells and the cancer is trying to help the body clean up the waste. What about a reframe on cancer? And that 67% of all tumors that are not surgeried or manipulated, they just resolve themselves, according to this guy's study I saw today in the Ajanu book. I'm not going with it yet. I gotta go find the citation, look at it myself, but that was quite a bold claim. You have the citation, I just gotta go look at it. So, if I can find this cartoon that shows how different things in the body processes more. I'll show it to you. I'd love to but see Dr. it. Dr. Royal Raymond Wright, with the microscopes that he created, yeah. he was actually taking photographs and film of live cells. I'd like to and see so that, some of that, yeah. Cartoons. They're not cartoons. 
there's a couple of presentations where you can see that information. Yeah. And his That's microscopes are very different than electron. They are, aren't they? Electron microscope doesn't take pictures of things that are alive. It kills them. Right. Oh, it kills them. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's why yeah. Dark yeah. Is so yeah. Oh, I didn't know so it killed stuff. Yeah, they're like light. They're, light light they're, light they're light. real microscopes. Uh -huh. oh. you haven't seen? There's like the one hour documentary. No, I got to see it. Oh, it's. Send me the link. Oh, yeah. Send me the link. I'd like to see that. So it's this Raymond Reif documentary? Yeah. Well, there's a couple, but this is my favorite. Yeah, send me the link to that one. I'd like to see that because oh, I'm. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah, send it to more of us. You send it around a lot. Sure, we'll probably play it. We can play it on Saturday night. James, you're welcome to sit in. I have a health class every Wednesday at 4 to 6. Monica's in it. We talk about all this deep shit. Yeah, you you're can welcome to sit in. Oh, every Wednesday at 4 to 6. Okay. And every class, we've done seven so far, they're all filmed with a PowerPoint. We're, we're, I'm building a library. But if you haven't seen... Any, I've seen any, it. Any, uh, you haven't seen... Oh. I have the Rife, I have the, the Rife machine now. Okay. I got the machine. I just need to get it hooked up to my computer. I'm a believer. I'll send you I'm a believer for I'll sure in Rife's worth. Yeah. It's a sad story. So that's the problem when we go into we get into this thing with microbes of the observer effect. Like somebody showed me this study to rationalize chocolate. The chocolate is a probiotic, was the study. And I just rolled my eyes. I'm like, who the fuck did that study? <laughs> so I went and looked up the study, and um, it, it was an in vitro study, first of all. It wasn't in vivo. So they did a fake gut. Somehow they made this fake gut. Yeah, it was a fake gut, you know. And um, and they put on your on your website. Right. Like just like that, fake gut. And and so they they put in twelve probiotics of their choosing into the fake gut, and then they fed it the chocolate of their choosing, and they got this a couple of the probiotics increased. Am I supposed to tell me that chocolate's a probiotic? Are you freaking kidding me? Sounds like Lily Wonka science. <laughs> <laughs> it sure does, doesn't it? It's wonky. It's wonky. It's wonky. Yeah, wonky. Yeah, that's even better. Thank you. Well, that was the same, the rat study, the rat study for comfrey that proved comfrey was toxic with the pyridisline alkaloids. That was like 15 rats fed the equivalent of 100 pounds of comfrey a day. Yeah. Yeah, it's like 40,000 leaves for humans was the extrapolation. You'd have to eat 40,000 leaves for it to be toxic to a human. It's so ridiculous. And yet they claim it's toxic because somebody might eat 40,000 leaves. You're yeah, right. Yeah, well. So I ate it every day for four years. So that's all you guys need to know. Mm -hmm. And was so better because of it. Well, the natives are kept comparing cancer with that. I think that's the history. That yes. came out, and so therefore they never pull it away. Not to mention everything else, but it does. And then uh, Ma Huang, ephedra, put on the blacklist. Yeah. Because athletes were abusing it, right? Mm -hmm. But I've never seen a better asthma herb, personally. Have you? I mean, excellent asthma herb. It acts like an EpiPen. Ma Huang? Ma Huang, M-A-H-U-A-N-G, right? Ma yeah. Huang. Or ephedra. Or ephedra, yeah, or ephedra. It's really hard to get now. You gotta go through eBay and, um, do you have a source for it? Oh. Yeah. It's really hard to get. Yeah. We grow it here. It is a type of horsetail, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a type of horsetail. I don't think it's an equisetum, though, but we, that'd be worthy of uh, trying to propagate. Yeah. I have a question with the viruses. Um, so we know viruses are not considered living by definition because they don't reproduce. They don't consume fuel and they don't give food. Then how do you explain all all the people who ended up taking a polio virus, a polio vaccine, have simian virus forty in their body and you know you can actualize it if you live a really terrible life, cancer. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people it hasn't actualized, if you will. Some some are lucky. Some of us have sugar cubes. Oh, right. For the vaccine, you know, little sugar cubes. Right. But then how do you see the simian 40 virus active, creating these cancers? And apparently some of them, like brain. So you think of viruses as waste products. So the simian was 
they probably toxified a bunch of monkeys and um, and then took their blood, isolated some particles, some RNA, DNA molecules, and then they called it the simian whatever. Um, most expressions of most things are based on our internal ecology. So the more toxic we are, the worse our outcome is going to be with any cancer, any virus. Our body, we all get cancer four to five times a day on average. Each of us does. And our body just deals with it. That's right. We get cancer four to five times a day. All of us do. All day, every day. Where's that? It's from our own... Think about it. You've got three zillion reactions going on in your body on any given day. A few of them are going to go wrong. Probably. Uh, well, you can that download. You that documentaries on the other and many other phones. Make sure we like to see that one. It just breaks it down to all the different things that come out of the body and take care of stuff. So I'm not poo-pooing germ theory. What I'm poo-pooing is the idea that the germ causes the problem. The problem is what the germ represents. Like Candida's Candida's not a victim thing in my world. It's you don't blame the bug that eats the rot when you're rotting from the inside out. You don't blame the bug, you blame your own fucking choices to cause the rot. That's a big challenge for us with the low cashier. Exactly. A lot of us, including Sarah G and a lot of the functional doctors are really trying to bring this forward. It's a big challenge. And of course, you know, big pharma solvers on the low cashier. Well, even Pasteur lamented, you know, he even, it was just that they, they ran with that because it meant a lot of money for a bunch of idiots. Oh, yeah. it meant a lot. Pasteurization is a gigantic industry. Anti-germ warfare is a gigantic industry. And, and that's kind of what we're, we're kind of working our way out of right now. We're kind of working our way out of all that. Um, the empower, what I'm trying to bring is the empowered view that you're responsible for your own health. And when you get a cancer or a cold or a flu, the way out is to detoxify and decongest. Foundations three and four. So how do you see it, things now with this Newsom, who is not supposed to be doing even the lockdowns, and is trying to housebound us, and they're bringing vaccines to California. The one that's out of here. And it looks like we're going to be housebound unless we take a vaccine. I mean, you can see the writing on the wall. So, yeah, well, what, what, what so they think. They were talking about that eight months ago. Yeah. So it's not new information. There's not going to be, there will not be forced vaccination. There will not be forced vaccination. Oh, there? Well, there will not be forced vaccination. But you will not be able to go to the store. You'll be able to go to the store. You'll be able to fly. You'll be able to travel. You won't be able to do it. So with two thirds saying we won't do it, we can be the white blood cells that handle the food. He's got a good point. He's got a good point. So we're getting the nanotechnology unless we're doing stuff to get rid of them. See, James has a whole angle that I really appreciate because I think that they're, they are spraying us from the chemtrails with it. Mm -hmm. I do think they are putting in the GMO oh, food. Um, so that's why I do coffee enemas, folks. That's why I take herbs, folks. That's why I live close to the earth, folks, because I don't want that shit getting a foothold in my body. And silica. 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 Absolute. The earth's crust is made of alumino silica. Silica binds aluminum better than anything because it's in the Earth's crust. Alumino silica is what the Earth is made of. No, you need the physiologic dose. Yeah. And what's the best couple of herbs high in silica? Horsetail and oat straw. Horsetail and what? Oat straw. You know, the straw oat of the oat. Straw. The oat straw. Oat straw. Okay. Any grain straw. You can take any grain, wheat, whatever, boil it up for 20 minutes. Um, and then you can extract and strain out the liquid that has the high silica in it. The product I used to use is a world organic, world organic brand, um, horsetail silica, it's called. World organic horsetail, sil silica 500, I think. It's like you get 500 milligrams of silica per tablet. I don't like that little drop of the silica drops. I've never seen anybody get results with that, um, personally. Never. I, I've seen better results with the silica 500 and plant-based silica. Whatever those freaking drops are, I, I have never seen anybody get a hair mineral analysis improved on that. Because I do hair mineral analysis to validate my findings. You've never seen them get improved? Improved aluminum numbers when they're on that oh, silica. Oh, higher aluminum. The aluminum, the aluminum should drop yeah. on your hair mineral analysis after doing therapy. Yeah. That's how I track it. 
Um, and it's important to track it because you often, you know, the symptoms start going away, but you still might show some. And generally, if you don't show at least a, a small bar of aluminum, I tell people like, then it's being stored somewhere because we're being exposed to aluminum all day, every day that we breathe. So you would better show some in your hair. If you don't, that means it's not in your hair and it's somewhere else, like your brain. Well, and that's, you know, the incredible increase in Alzheimer's is, is aluminum in, in our brain. In the wrong form of aluminum. We need aluminum like in parts per billion. We need this tiny bit of aluminum. We need certain minerals in parts per million or billion, like aluminum is one and nickel is another, and even arsenic, you know, in tiny homeopathic doses, parts per billion or million. And also far infrared sauna holds a lot of snap Great far infrared so enemas, very helpful. And it's okay just to do a straight coffee enema, or you like it always has to be the three stage. You don't want to be decaf. <laughs> You don't want shit water going back to your colon. You need to clear that colon before you do the coffee enema. You yeah. always have to clear that shit. You, don't want, you want shit water going back to your portal veins to your colon? No, you don't want that. So you always got to clear it. Okay, so a coffee enema is a several stage. Well, you could do just the coffee enema, but then you've got coffee and shit going back to your liver. I tell people that that's why... You start with a saltwater enema in my world, and then once you do okay with that, then you move over to the coffee. Meaning you do saltwater enemas a few times? You know, try two or three or four times to see how you do. If it's, if it's difficult, you should not be doing coffee. Because yeah. coffee is more extreme than saltwater. How much salt per gallon of water? One tablespoon of salt per quart of water. Per quart of water. Mm -hmm. That's the correct osmo osmolality. Are you using Himalayan salt? Or nope, water? Celtic only. There is no Himalayan left. You'd be clear about that. It's all pink salt now. And they're, I'm a salt snob, man. I'll pick any other brand, but I don't use Himalayan pink salt because they're not Himalayan anymore. It's pink salt from Poland or Siberia, or and there's no contamination test done on it. I'm not going to throw my health on the roulette wheel. The Celtic salt's checked every year. So no, no more pink salt. What about red Can we 98% sodium chloride. It's on the Codex Alimentarius. Part of the conspiracy with salt. A real salt is 85% sodium chloride. It's not 98. It's not real salt. It's a good transition salt to the real salts, but it's not a real salt. And if it, and if it is unrefined, then it's too much sodium. You, know, you just gotta go look at the data. Real salts from seawater and even some of the, the real pink salts, 85% sodium chloride. Next highest mineral is magnesium chloride. So, um, yeah, the salt you choose is very important. That's why I'm a snob for 25 years using Celtic salt. I used to buy Paul Galon. Paul Galon, of, uh, our local guy here, he was selling real Himalayan pink salt. I don't know if he's still sourcing that or not, but if you want to see if he's got pink salt, then he's probably got a good source. I trust Paul. He's generally good, knows what he's doing. So yeah, you want to get used to the fact that, because if you're getting this, this stuff going in here, this enema, and then if it's hard to even get it in, that's the first sign that your portal veins are all clogged up. Because you want it to go in and you want those portal veins to fill up with the excessive water right, from the rectum. And if those can't fill up, like the tube should be like that big and it's only that big, then it's going to sit in your rectum and cause a big balloon. And you're going to want to go and get it out. So it's all information in my world. You know, if it's, so if you don't do well with the saltwater enema, then you need to figure out why. Right now for beginning enema people is lay on your fricking back, make it as simple as possible, and then massage it around and then get it the hell out for your first few times. You want this low hanging fruit, not a lot of instruction. Um, left side, it's going to stay on the left side, the colon. The, the, the colon goes, starts here and goes around like that. So by laying on your left side, you're keeping the water on this side. You do a coffee and then you roll over to your right side and get it going over towards the liver. That's the only other instruction I give for enemas. I don't like the left side enema because uh, maybe to start out for 30 seconds, but no, you want that fluid going over towards the liver over here. You want to lay on your right side. Um, you recommend light roast or dark roast for <laughs> no, you're right. Um, the best coffee enema coffee is a light roast, organic, single origin. 
None of those blends. You're gonna keep all this on the video? It's all on video still. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. We could even chop this part off and make a separate video just for the enemas. I got a pretty good nine minute coffee video, coffee enema video. I was just telling James it got 5,600 views in the last few years. So, so in a, a successful salt enema means you're getting more stuff clearing out. More, more shit is coming out with it. I don't like the idea of using enemas to clear your colon. I never liked that idea. Um, I like the idea. Successful. You just get in and get it out with ease and you feel good afterwards. Wow. I'm kind of highly salted, warm coffee. Drank like two and a half quarts of it. What did that do? Oh. <laughs> Clean you up? Drank oh, okay. I drank it. Dang After right. about an hour, just sitting there. On the toilet? Yeah. <laughs> and then, For how long? Did you, you know, witness this? Several different times. But uh. <laughs> after a while, it was just the coffee cup. Oh, really? So, oh, it cleared everything. Oh, no. I did it drinking it. You mean you drank and didn't I, eat I it was it was yeah it was yeah nasty days? four bucks coffee with ice so it had and then I made it so it was like hot and warm so I could actually gulp it down take a full swallow and a fair amount of uh, the Redmond salt oh and my God. after about an hour boom <laughs> you just had to stay for a while <laughs> but after a while everything cleared out of my system and the only time I've ever had a colonoscopy I don't think I'll ever do it again. Uh, um, I didn't have an anesthesia. Oh, the propylene glycol. You didn't take that. I did, but I did the coffee first because I, I was playing with it. I, oh, you did the I coffee follow, thing first? I didn't follow the directions. They said don't eat for 24 hours. And I had a pretty sizable meal. 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I cleared that off by 11 o'clock. Look at this guy. And, and I think I... <laughs> oh, no. uh, said, my, my intestines were clean, <laughs> and he didn't even ask my permission to take off. It was totally clean. There was nothing in there. He's like, "Oh, that's a problem." That's not a follow-up from anything I looked like. He was like, oh, "I'm going to do a sandwich." I was like, "Hey," because I didn't have an anesthesia. But, oh no, you can clear it with. Yeah, I don't. I won't do it. You can. Oh no, I tried it with just coffee and salt. Yeah, it's it's no, that's what I've done. I've never had an enema. Oh man! So James is onto something because people. I just just I had a client earlier today. That's what you said. I have a sometimes I have a cup of coffee, but my bowels don't move all the way. So yeah, you had kind of like that half bowel movement in the morning. You know, the other half still in there. That's a liver problem. That's a liver issue. You got that incomplete bowel movement, and she has her coffee to finish it. And I go, I go. Well, when you start working on your liver, and making sure your bile is flowing because the bile is a natural laxative. So salt. You add salt to the coffee. Everybody knows if you do enough salted water, you'll get the runs. Oh, yeah. You put enough salt in some water, that'll give you the runs. And then coffee is a well known laxative. You put the two together, I was like, that's why I was like, James? <laughs> Fuck. He's really experimenting. That's a serious experiment in my world. It's like, wow. Okay. I mean, it just, but it's only James could get away with that, you know? No, because my buddy. Only James had, could get away with that. Uh, Colonoscopy. Colonoscopy. His, yeah. He was told just not to I'm eat loving it. For like 11.30 at night. And so he and I got the same prescribed crap. And so the instructions I got from the people were, 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 were 24 hours. And I'm like, which I tried, but I got really hangry. And somebody had some food, and so I, I ate it. <laughs> and, and, and I know I got it. But it's funny that he's your buddy. Oh, what buddy? But. Oh. <laughs> 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 I knew we'd get to the laughter sooner or later. <laughs> yeah, it's a shit show. It's a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> oh man all because of salt and coffee <laughs> so how good an idea is it to drink salt water sometimes to see if you can get runs from it is that so, okay laxative? okay let me, let me throw a point of caution here because what james did um i had a couple of people try some really similar but 
your idea wasn't dumb. Their idea was one lady. What did she, she do? Knows his body. He can do stuff oh yeah, he's he's people. an animal over there. You know, yeah. like, like <laughs> I would have never have gotten away with that. I would have had electrolyte deficiencies so severe I would have had leg cramps that night from that. Um, it just shows what vitality you have, bro. Was one client thought that taking Epsom salts orally was a good idea. And then, you know, I get a phone call at eight o'clock in the morning and it had been 24 hours of just constant liquid coming out. And every time, cause she was trying to drink water or whatnot. So this poor woman, this poor woman had, she had enough of my training to be dangerous, you know, cause her, her boyfriend was my, um, one of my assistants. And so, oh, I'll do it. And it's like, you know, you do Epsom salt foot bath. Uh, right. Don't do it orally, for God's sakes. Oh, you know, so it, it took me 48 hours to clean her up, but she, we almost sent her off to Dominican for, you know, electrolyte infusion because she was in a bad shape. And when you get that bad, um, it's like the person that's been starving for a month and you can't throw a bunch of food in them right away or they'll die. It's the same thing. You got to get the minerals back in these people slowly or they'll just they'll, they'll croak. It's a very, very dangerous place to be. I had a friend that was delivering a child. They think she kept drinking water, and she got uh, so much electrolytes washed out of her from drinking too much water that she almost died, and the baby died. You mean and distilled water? Died? You mean distilled water? Yeah, yeah. She was drinking too much water, and she 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 washed out all of her electrolytes while she was she was in labor for like you know twenty four hours or something, and she wow. got her electrolytes got so low because she was drinking water and the, the she almost died of electrolyte loss and her baby did die her baby did die oh how sad they finally gave her an iv of electrolytes and, and she came, she came back i think it was four hours dead. Yeah. well let me, let's, let's let's fix this conversation yeah. so Spring water is very highly mineralized. That's why it's naturally slightly alkaline. That's what the whole thing with the alkaline water. So if she was been drinking spring water, she would not have hit that place. Right. So whatever form of water, like I drank distilled water for a year and a half only. And I knocked out my libido. Distilled water is a very specific water intake for people with arthritis and have excessive bony deposits because that starts to erode excessive bony deposits. That's been known since 1930s. So I thought distilled water tasted great though. So I was just guzzling. I I love the taste of distilled water, you know, it's so clean. You know, it's just H2O. It's like, wow, this stuff tastes really clean. And then a year and a half later, I was like, how come my kidneys aren't working really well? How come I'm always angry and irritable? I was also vegan, which didn't help. It did not help. I think you're right. Because what's hydrogen? turns into hydrochloric acid. What's oxygen? A very reactive molecule. So on the surface, pure water is not that great. Then you add, what's a carbohydrate? Just add on a carbon. Carbohydrates and fat in their pure form. That's all they are. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That's why we call my business health alchemy, right? It's all alchemy elements. Um, but you need those trace minerals with the sugar and with the fat and with the protein because they're all acidic by nature. All of your macronutrients, all of them. The vegans get all uppity about you know their alkaline diet, and they're full of shit because amino acids are what regulates your pH in your body primarily. And no one talks about that. It's another reason to get enough protein in your diet. My therapist was here earlier, and she was whining about it. she had her little Vega bar with pea fucking protein in it, and I'm you know I'm like not gonna cut it, honey. <laughs> Every one of my teachers, old Chinese guys, old. You know, Ayurvedic guys, old Western guys, to a T, 100% unanimous. Protein powders are should not be your primary protein source because they're hard to absorb. And they're lifeless. They're powder. So I would tend to agree, but in today's world, you know, people generally feel better when they see that number. I got my 100 grams of protein Craig wants me to get. So, you know, it was just that Vega bar was like, you know, it's chocolate and full of, the, the first ingredient's pea protein powder and the second ingredient is agave syrup and the sugar and the protein they don't go well together especially agave yeah it's just high fructose it's a, it's a, fructose is a five carbon sugar the body can't use fructose not now not ever 
So we have to take a lot of energy to convert that to the six carbon, the hexagon sugar molecule, which is a six carbon molecule. A little better if it's rock. Agave? Um, what you see with agave, I've been studying it for about 10 or 15 years, we tend to see a higher triglycerides of people that use agave, which means sludgier blood. So, no thanks. And they used to say it's a little blood sand. It comes from tequila. Right. Well, it comes from the agave cactus, right? Mm -hmm. And um, if you're not doing a lot of fruit, fruit's high in fructose. And um, never, ever buy crystalline fructose. I used to use it as a sweetener because of the low glycemic thing. You're going to sludge up your liver faster than anything with pure fructose. Um, so, yeah, you, you, want, you want glucose, not fructose. That's my point. So yeah, the protein um, generally, yeah, you want to make sure you're getting a protein at least, you know, in its raw, least refined form because your connective tissue is one third protein. Your neurotransmitters are protein. Your insulin's made of protein. Kind of get the hint. Your pH is regulated by protein. Yeah. So if you don't get enough protein to fat in your diet, you can't regulate your blood sugar well. And your mood won't be good. Who did I tell you they have to have protein every meal? What did I tell you that, Monica? Protein every meal? Yeah, yesterday. Well, they get to your 100 grams of protein a day. You know, you're only having two meals. That's 50 grams of protein each time you eat. That's like two four ounce steaks. That's why I say have three meals if you need to and have a little bit of protein, 30 grams of each. You might, some people don't need that much. You know, you just base it by your meals. But for me, I'm going to make sure I get enough protein because. If you're protein deficient and you don't figure it out for 10 years, guess what? You've got osteopenia. And I'm not going to take that chance. That's why I take my protein, my digestive enzymes, my stomach acid, my herbs, and my pepsin and all that. But it's my health insurance. So don't pay some person later for a broken ankle that didn't need to happen. I just see it all over the place now, you know. Hip replacement. Not me. I broke my fucking neck. No replacement, no surgery, nothing. Blew out my MCO. No surgery, no replacement, nothing. 18, 19 years of managing a, I should have had surgery. Comfrey, protein. I'll go back to what, uh, then we'll, we'll have to end soon. What Robert Mendelssohn said in his book, Confessions of a Medical Heretic in the 1970s. I told you guys this before. Robert Mendelssohn, you'll love this book, James, Confessions of a Medical Heretic. A physician that retired at age 55 because he was so disgusted with the experimentation on people in the hospital. He dropped out and retired at age 55. And here's his quote. If modern medicine was to disappear off the face of the earth, 90% of all illness would disappear with it. Oh, you know, I've heard that before. What's his name again? Mendelssohn, M-E-N, -M -E D-E-L-S-O-H-M, Mendelssohn. With, with the reporting now, with the COVID and less people going, keeping their kids to pediatricians, right. SIDS have dropped. Mm. And infants, you know, you can oh, really? vaccinated to keep right. to, mm -hmm. yes. yes. SIDS have dropped. Wow. Yes. Yeah. We were just talking about that the other day. That's awesome. Wow. About 200,000 less deaths this year as opposed to 2018. Really? Yeah. 200,000? 200,000 less. In the United States. Children? No. Oh, overall. overall. Yeah. Like 2.8, 2.9. Where was that? Where was that? Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's tremendous. <laughs> oh, I was yeah, talking this morning. Well, you're I not had in the hospital. Bad 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Just the numbers of deaths in the United States. Yeah. And that's according to the CDC. So who? Yeah, right. You can't trust them. Right. No, you can't trust them. You can't trust any of those three letter things. No. Wow. Four There's letters. three letters. Well, you know, you know, you know what? What's that doctor who said the doctor who has his CD? That doctor is still alive. Any of those three letters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Which one? Yeah. What's the same dead doctor still alive? Oh, yeah. Who's that? He, he's he's spoken here before. What's his name? Dr. Wallach. Wallach, that's right. He's yeah. a veterinarian and then also an MD. Oh, isn't Tom Cowan talking, talking on some radio oh, show now? Oh, yes, yeah. on the contagion yeah. myth. Yeah. The yeah. contagion. It's his new book. He's really into the minerals. 
the contagion. Always healing the animals on the farm with loads of minerals. That's right. When they got sick, he gave them more minerals. That's right. And, yeah. Wow. Oh, what's the name of the guy? Tom Cowan, okay. MD. Who was interviewing him, Ellie? Tom Quinn. Tom Quinn. Oh, he's running right on KSEO on Saturday, uh, tomorrow. Yeah, he's really been on the COVID. That's right? Yeah, he has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I want you guys to understand that Tom Cowan is putting his life on the line. Yes. Right. He is yeah. putting his life on the line. So listen quick before you snuff him. Yeah, they might snuff him out. They could scalar wave him. You know what that. About, oh, yeah. Well, then what about Zach Bush? Because he's also speaking out. And, uh, yeah, Zach is really guitar. powerful. Zach has that young, good-looking guy thing. Yeah. And he's, he's, he's got right. so much going on. He's in Hawaii. I mean, Zach's the real deal, yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, so is Tom. Yeah. Well, they're both the real deal, but but somehow Zach seems protected. I don't know how, but he, he's an oncologist, an endocrinologist. Zach he is was dealing with feelings, and he was really dealing with cancer, heavy duty cancer patients, and realized you know that wasn't where it was at. You know. Well, you know, we have our own. You know, we're a bit. Everybody here is pretty much preaching to the choir. So, you know, I had my therapist over here today and, and I told her, I go, you're here because you're on the fence kind of person and you're the person I need to reach. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with you. I think you're brainwashed, but I don't feel safe with you. I can't do therapy with you because I don't feel safe that you're looking at CNN for your news source. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> How can I ever feel safe with someone that has CNN as their main news source? They don't even, they don't even source properly. You know, you don't even have a credible source. Like, some opinion piece from the Washington Post they're citing. Why do I give a fuck what some guy the Washington Post said? Yeah. You know? These op-eds, you know? And views, not news. So, yeah, and we'll, we'll put a shout out to the dead doctor, Nicholas Gonzalez. Um, he was a cancer doctor, did excellent work. And we'll put a shout out to our local guy who they killed with the scalar wave, um, Dr. John Hicks, who I personally knew and had dinner with him and his wife many times. He was signing too many vaccine waivers and found himself dead one day. James, I have a video. He, he, me and Kelly adored him. He beat Kavos. He has. I have a video on my YouTube channel of him talking about beat Kavos. Dr. John Hicks. Oh, let's just put him on. We'll turn off. Okay, bye, folks. We're done with the dinner. We're going on something else.